which in our frames are going to look at the EDI. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So we're going to look at the etiology, the incidence, and the magnitude of GI bleeding or stress-related mucosal bleeding in the ICU. We're going to talk about the pathogenesis in uh, determining the appropriateness of treatment, and we're going to talk about the preventative uh, methods. So we're talking about stress-related mucosal bleeding here, not ulcer disease. So we're going to start off with a, a question uh, to see what your foundational knowledge in this area is. A 68-year-old woman is admitted to the ICU for community-acquired pneumonia observation. You should consider, number one, treatment with continuous H2 blockers to prevent GI mucosal injury, treatment with intermittent H2 blockers to prevent gastric mucosal injury, three, no prophylaxis needed unless he is intubated for more than two days, and four, treatment with uh, proton pump inhibitors to prevent gastric mucosal injury. Go ahead and vote now. Again, uh, the correct answer was uh, chosen by the majority. The correct answer is no prophylaxis is needed unless he's intubated for more than two days. So we're starting out with uh, good knowledge, though we can bring a few along, it looks like. So there are obviously millions of ICU patients, and um, a few will die in the ICU. We also know that GI mucosal and motor dysfunction is part and parcel of systemic critical illness. We also know that bleeding is associated with an adverse outcome, a markedly increased length of stay of over a week, which in most institutions will add more than $20,000 to costs. And the mortality ranges an increased mortality between one and fourfold. The stress-related mucosal injury may develop within 24 hours. Certainly, if you look on an endoscopic basis, you'll see that almost 100% uh, of individuals at 48 hours will develop this disease. So Deborah Cook really is credited with uh, the vast majority of uh, evidence-based data in this area. And in her two landmark studies in 94 and then in 2001, you can see that the mortality associated with mucosal bleeding, again, this is not peptic ulcer disease bleeding, this is stress-related mucosal bleeding, is significantly elevated um, whether you didn't have a bleed or did, and this is true over a decade of time. So the most important first thing is all getting on the same page as what defines and how do we interpret the data from clinical trials in an evidence-based manner. We need to have a single definition of what is stress-related mucosal bleeding uh, in the intensive care unit. As I mentioned previously, the most sensitive way to diagnose this would be endoscopic bleeding, and virtually everyone will have that at 48 hours. That may explain why everyone thinks everyone needs to be on some sort of prophylaxis. It's incorrect, and I'll show you why. Now, if you use clinically evident bleeding, which again has been used historically in clinical trials, well, that's if you see a little bit of blood in the NG tube, if you see a guaiac positive uh, uh, stool or NG, if you actually have a little hematemesis, all of these are consistent with what's termed clinically evident bleeding, but again, this is a pretty sensitive diagnosis and overly calls the importance of this disease. What I really want to uh, focus your attention on and what should be known and used by providers is this definition proposed by Deborah Cook and used um, in most studies today in the literature, and that is clinically important GI bleeding. Hemodynamic instability associated with bleeding from the GI tract, a, decre a measured decrease in hemoglobin requiring a blood transfusion. So that's what we should be trying to prevent. And when we do that, what did you see in her landmark paper of, uh, of risk factors and incidents, what I would call the natural history of this problem, over 2,000 patients, the incidence of bleeding using this diagnosis, 1.5%. Now, if you look endoscopically, what do you see? Well, you see multiple subendothelial petechiae, which may coalesce uh, 
and you see um, uh, microscopically, you see coagulation necrosis of the mucosa and subsequent hemorrhage, which clinically looks uh, to be quite a lot, but again, these are not important causes of bleeding in the vast majority. Now, if we look at the pathophysiology of this disease, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about three critical factors. Acid secretion, so we need to understand and consider the role of acid secretion. Mucosal ischemia and splanchnic hypoperfusion, so just being sick and not getting adequate blood flow. But this is also one of the mechanisms of uh, alcohol and aspirin, which also has another effect. And then reflux of upper GI contents into the stomach, particularly bile salts, so some sort of um, uh, reflux because bile acids and bile salts are extremely caustic uh, to an unprotected stomach. So, of course, that has nothing to do with acid or acid prevention. Now, when you look at um, the pathophysiology, again, one of the um, common terms is splanchnic hypoperfusion, which just occurs from being uh, critically ill. There may be a line of uh, pathophysiology related to catecholamines that may be related to a decrease in cardiac output. But there are also other important aspects, such as reduced bicarb secretion, which again is protective against the acid secretion which occurs. I mentioned the mucosal blood flow. Decreased GI motility, which is virtually uniform in our patients, is associated with back diffusion of bile acids. And then um, at the very uh, interface between the mucosa and the epithelium, typically there's a mucosal layer that prevents acid back diffusion into the uh, cellular elements. And this is regulated by prostaglandins. So anything that decreases prostaglandin production Uh, particularly PGE, is going to interfere with the mucus layer, which is an essential component of protection in the GI uh, GI mucosa. This is a very complex uh, slide, which again shows the role of prostaglandins and also shows the role of lipid peroxidation, which inherently destabilizes um, membranes. So there are multiple roles um, that actually the mucosa can be injured. And simply thinking that PPI and acid production is the only way to treat this is an error, and I'll show you why. So the cellular defense, as I mentioned, has uh, many, many ways. The role of prostaglandins are really as a primary uh, prevention of uh, of ulcers, and I'll briefly talk at ulcers at the end. It accelerates healing uh, by a really fairly unknown uh, mechanism. It reduces acid secretion directly, and it has uh, cytoprotective effects. Sulcrophate actually enhances mucus production by an uh, unknown mechanism. We certainly know that acid secretion occurs by uh, uh, at least three common mechanisms, gastrin, histamine, and acetylcholine. And any one of these pathophysiologic uh, mechanisms needs to be considered and or modulated if we truly wanted to completely remove the risk. But again, you may be causing unintended consequences by doing so. Now, the PPI, the proton pump inhibitors, work actively by the exchange of hydrogen ions uh, in the parietal cell for luminal potassium. And this, of course, is the primary mechanism for proton uh, pump inhibitors uh, uh, decreasing acid secretion in the lumen, one of the important mechanisms uh, for mucosal stress-related bleeding. Now, when we talk about a target pH, again, this is uh, essential information in understanding what our target is and whether or not there are important differences in therapy. First, we know that a low pH, only 3.5, there will be a decreased rate of stress-related bleeding, and I'll show you a bit of uh, data on uh, the pH of 4. If you want to inactivate pepsin, again, a primary uh, uh, player in uh, the production of acid, you need to be a bit higher, four and a half. But if you really want to treat peptic ulcer recurrence, 
you need to get a pH higher, a pH of around 6. Pepsin isn't destroyed until a pH greater than 8, which is almost unachievable in most uh, individuals. Now, this is turning back to Deborah Cook's uh, landmark paper and really is the one that recognizes there are two, two and only two critical factors that puts a patient at risk. That's respiratory failure and whether or not they have a coagulopathy. So let's, again, look at the data from her New England Journal paper. She identified 847 of her 2,200 patients who were considered to be uh, at a high risk, those with respiratory failure or coagulopathy. And of those 847, again, of the 2,247 individuals in this trial, there were 31 instances, only 3.7%, that's the high-risk group, had clinically important bleeding. Of the other 1,400, two. So I would say, based on this alone, why are all patients in the ICU, if they don't have one or both of those interventions, why are they all receiving some form of GI prophylaxis, the most overutilized medications uh, in the ICU today? Well, there are other individuals, again, a different publication. This is earlier than Deborah Cook's data, suggesting that there are other issues. And you can see, at least in this paper, the number of risk factors did have some overall relationship. But the two most important, respiratory failure defined as intubated and mechanically ventilated for more than 48 hours, and the presence of coagulopathy. So ARS question number two, the most important risk factor for stress-related mucosal injury is, this is, are you paying attention, intubation, mechanical ventilation for 24 hours, mechanical ventilation for 48 hours, coagulation abnormalities, INR greater than 1.4, or shock. Ten seconds. I'll be disappointed if this is not 100%. Henry said that he was just going to throw the data off. Well, there were a few people that didn't get it right. Um, in fact, it is mechanical ventilation for 48 hours. The reason why number four is not correct is that the odds ratio was lower. This is an important risk factor. Again, in board questions, you have to look the most important risk factor. Well, what about helicobacter pylori? What, what are the data on this, and how does this contribute to GI mucosal bleeding? Well, in fact, the data are conflicting. What we do know is that if you have helicobacter pylori, the severity of your disease is likely to be increased. So not the probability of bleeding, but the severity of bleeding. Again, 50% uh, um, would be seropositive for occult bleeding versus 100% of those having significant bleeding. Didn't predict whether you got it, just how severe it was. The, these are data, uh, fairly recent data, uh, published uh, a few years ago. A large number of patients looking at, again, the presence of H. pylori antigen in the stool overall, 6%, seen higher in, uh, in women and severity of illness, but it was not associated in this trial with where, whether or not you needed transfusion, you required upper endoscopy, or whether you actually had bleeding. So a severity indicator, but not a risk factor for the disease uh, for stress-related mucosal bleeding. Certainly, it is a, uh, a marker of peptic ulcer disease different pathophysiology. Now, what are the prevention uh, options? Well, we certainly know, based on the pathophysiology we mentioned, that there are several uh, possibilities, antacids, sulcrophate, H2 blockers, PPIs, and I'm not going to talk about the newer agents uh, because this isn't uh, the reason for this course. So the best preventative strategy, again, take your ARS in hand. The best preventative therapy for stress-related gastritis is sulcrophate because there is pneumonia, less pneumonia. H2 blockers giving us a continuous infusion. PPIs with capsule-opened contents given by nasogastric tube. And H2 blockers given intermittently. Uh, 
Go ahead uh, and vote now. Interesting. So there's really um, a majority who believe H2 blockers given intermitt intermittently is correct. I would say this is the best answer, but none of the answers are particularly good. I would agree that this is the best answer. Let's talk about why it's the best answer and why the others are not. So let's look first at antacids. This is a trial done by Mike Zinner, published uh, uh, many years ago, looking at um, administration of antacids to achieve a pH greater than 3.5, again, that critical pH that I mentioned a few slides ago. You could see that the bleeding rates were substantially diminished by this uh, treatment strategy, but you needed to titrate antacids every one to two hours. And this may be associated, though it was not in this clinical trial, with an increased uh, risk of aspiration. So what we know is this is an effective treatment. It certainly was the standard when I began my clinical practice uh, 30 years ago, in part because Mike Zinner was at my institution. Uh, but this was abandoned many years ago, frankly, not because it doesn't work. It's too nursing intensive. What about sulcophate? Well, we know that sulcophate binds to epithelial cells for uh, protection. It has no effect on pH, so it doesn't deal with uh, acid mucosal injury. It um, certainly has been proven in clinical trials, the majority of clinical trials, to be better than uh, uh, placebo and better than antacids, but it's not better than H2 blockers, and it isn't associated again, based on uh, Deborah Cook's trial in uh, the New England Journal uh, here, it did not have a lower rate of pneumonia. It trended in that uh, uh, fashion. Surprisingly, in this clinical trial, actually, the bleeding rate was almost twofold higher in, uh, in that trial. Again, this was an unexpected finding at the time. Uh, it's generally considered to be an effective treatment. So what, what about H2 blockers? Certainly, Cimetidine was the uh, prototype, initial prototype. There are many, many, many that have followed. But virtually all of them have pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic complications in their uh, metabolism, and you need to know about their drug interactions. Drugs that depend on an acid environment may not work, and you need to certainly know about that. Uh, and uh, ketoconazole and uh, HIV meds are among the most notable in this area. What do we know about H2 blockers versus PPI? This is results from a clinical trial a few years ago. This used uh, cimetidine in a continuous uh, infusion versus uh, pentoprazole given uh, two to three times a day. Tolerance was seen by day two with cimetidine but not with pantoprazole. And this is why continuous infusion with H2 blockers, while initially more, may be more effective in controlling initial pH over time with diminished effectiveness due to tolerance. What else do we know about H2 blockers? Again, continuous infusion, 131 patients. The bleeding rate was uh, uh, lower than placebo maintained a high uh, uh, intragastric pH greater than uh, 6 versus falling below 4 within uh, 4 to uh, 5 hours when given intermittently. When you look at the 10 randomized trials of H2 blockers versus placebo, the effectiveness is that it reduces bleeding rate when given as an intermittent infusion by about 50%. So substantially important in its uh, effectiveness. Now what about PPIs? Let's uh, turn our discussion to PPIs. First of all, they're all prodrugs. In the presence of acid, it's converted, uh, it's uh, actually protonated and undergoes a conformational change which then allows it to be effectiveness. It binds to cysteine of the PPI uh, uh, pump and it works only on active pumps.
active pumps are um, seen in the presence of meals. So this is why a PPI does not have an immediate effectiveness and why the commercial products on TV try to enhance this uh, difference between H2 blockers and PPIs because it's only on active, um, uh, active uh, um, pumps. Again, it takes three or four days to see the maximum benefit uh, in uh, acid reduction. PPIs, if they're given uh, orally, they must be given in an enteric capsule because they're inactivated by acid. And again, uh, to some extent, they have some um, metabolic derangements, and I'm going to comment on this uh, further in the next slide. This is just to show you the cleverness and importance of uh, construction of uh, oral medications. In fact, there are many, many layers in uh, PPI capsules that are essential to prevent its initial deactivation. Now, what you may or may not know is that there are um, polymorphisms that affect the metabolism of PPIs in a substantial way, and they're divided into what are called slow and normal metabolizers. And if you look at the genetic populations, Asians, specifically Koreans and Japanese, have about 20% incidence of slow metabolism. Now, what is its importance? Well, the half-life is normally about an hour for normal metabolizers and up to 10 hours in poor metabolizers. Fortunately, we know, at least in short-term use, the, um, uh, the toxicity is not a concern, but it is possible in long-term use that slow metabolizers could be at higher risk for things like uh, GI lymphoma, which has been associated with long-term uh, long risk. The prodrugs I mentioned um, in this trial which is uh, um, one of the classic trials in this area. Omeprazole was compared with sulcrophate versus ranitidine. And you can see that it appeared that the PPI in this, uh, in this trial was more effective. However, when you look at the fact that there were three arms and 67 patients, it's not surprising to think that, in fact, there was no significant difference uh, in, uh, in this uh, clinical trial. What other uh, trials do we know at? This is one of the uh, largest, if not the largest, clinical trial in the area, looking at omeprazole immediate release in oral suspension given with bicarb to fight off the acid problem I previously uh, described. Significant uh, bleeding was similar in both groups, and there was no difference in the effectiveness as measured by either low pH or the development of pneumonia. This is, uh, these are some of the data from Conrad's clinical trial pointing out the confidence interval showing that what he determined in this clinical trial, again, it's a 2005 clinical trial, so post-dated Deborah Cook's um, attempt to standardize the definitions. Interestingly, in this uh, pharmacologically supported trial, clinically significant bleeding was not her definition of need for transfusion, et cetera. It was blood in the NG. Even with that definition, they were unable to show a difference. Now, what do practitioners actually think about this? Well, I thought you should be aware that we all tend to uh, think that PPIs are in some way more effective, though I've shown you data to suggest that, in fact, that's not true. So at least in this uh, UK study, if you had low risk, you tended to choose H2 blockers, and if you had high risk, you tended to choose PPI. I am not supporting that based on evidence. It clearly is uh, an emotional approach to selecting uh, uh, agents. So the, again, these are similar data suggesting that no matter what your risk factor is, you're very likely, to, if you're in an ICU, you're going to get one of these agents, and we really need to apply a better evidence-based practice could be one of those performance improvement modules uh, that uh, Dr. Spevitz spoke about earlier. This is the most re recent meta-analysis on this topic, again showing uh, data from the Levy trial, which I showed you, and the Conrad trial. And you can see that, um, uh, that there appears to be some significant uh, uh, benefit from the use of PPIs 
uh, PPIs over um, H2 blockers, but in fact, it's heavily weighted towards uh, trials uh, that are very, very small, and I would say it's not a consensus opinion. Um, here again is a more recent uh, clinical trial, um, meta-analysis on the topic published in Critical Care Medicine in this past year. And you can see in this, uh, what I think is a much better uh, meta-analysis, that in fact, taking all of these uh, trials, of which Conrad and Somberg are the largest, there's no significant benefit of PPIs over H2 blockers. Briefly, what, what's, um, some people get confused about stress-related mucosal injury versus ulcer disease, and I'm not really talking about GI bleeding from ulcers, but I wanted to mention briefly this topic so that you're not confused. There are, there's many, many clinical trials on this topic with more than 4,000 patients. Two things to know. No difference in mortality when PPIs are used for the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. Rebleeding rates, however, are substantially lower versus control, and need for surgery is also significantly lower. So it isn't going to affect whether you live or die, but it is going to affect whether you need surgery or whether you rebleed. Similarly, seven controls looking at um, whether or not you should have long term treatment, um, so rebleeding and no long term treatment and H. Uh, pylori eradication, you can see that when you eradicate but don't use long-term treatment, there's a significant uh, benefit to H. pylori treatment. Again, I'm talking about peptic ulcer disease and GI bleeding. What about uh, long-term anti-secretory uh, therapy and the treatment of uh, H. pylori? Again, when compared to controls where you, uh, you did not use either anti-secretory treatment and or H. pylori eradication, there's um, a very low number needed to treat. So in the presence of GI bleeding secondary to peptic ulcer disease, and I would venture to say in the presence of identified H. pylori disease and, and mucosal-related bleeding, that you should both treat and then provide at least, uh, least short-term, if not long-term, anti-secretory treatment. Should you give uh, uh, PPIs uh, for peptic ulcer disease before endoscopy? And in fact, I hope you can see here that the use of PPI did not uh, do anything ex except show uh, a decrease in stigmata of bleeding but it's important then to begin uh, early treatment principally because of, uh, of this finding, though again, a modest amount of clinical information in this area. So what are the conclusions from this section? Stress-related ulcers can and do occur in critically ill patients with identifiable risk factors, but we're talking about a fairly small number of uh, individuals, maybe 3.7% of high-risk individuals, H2 blockers have proven efficacy, but they do to us tolerance when used as a continuous infusion. PPIs have not been subjected to significant study, about 1,000 patients overall in many clinical trials, the largest of which is about 300 patients. They do uh, increase pH, and some patients are slow metabolizers. Patients with peptic ulcer bleeding should be placed on PPIs before endoscopy, and the changes of significant uh, uh, bleeding are seen on endoscopy, but it will not affect the diagnosis overall. With peptic ulcer disease, rebleeding and need for surgery is decreased, but mortality is not. Um, and finally, it's unclear if H. pylori is a cause of stress-related mucosal injury, but it should be treated when identified because it is associated, even in stress mucosal-related disease, with severity of bleeding, and therefore the recommendation is for triple therapy, even in that setting. Thank you very much.